And all of a sudden, he comes out, flying out of his house, out of the driveway, jumps right in front of my truck, and just stands there with his arms by his side in his underwear. So back in college, um, one of the things I did to um, make money was uh, I drove a snowplow. A friend of mine had a bunch of trucks and had a contract with a city back in Massachusetts where I was living. So I got to drive a truck. So the truck I had was a smaller one. It was a four wheel drive pickup truck. So I got to do all the more intricate areas of plowing that some of the larger dump trucks couldn't get, you know, the more the hills and in tight spaces. And you know, it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of things you can get away with when you're driving a snow plow at night and there's snowstorms because there's no cars on the road. You're the only one really out there at three o'clock in the morning. So, you know, traffic lights, you don't really have to pay attention to them very much. Um, there's suggestions at that, you know, at that time. But the one thing I learned early on when I first did it, it was always make sure you know where manhole covers are. Because when you hit a manhole cover with a steel blade, it shakes the truck. It makes a loud bang and it shakes it and you think you're gonna, truck is gonna break in half because it's such an, an impact. So you start to learn to know your route and know where all they are and before you come up on one, you lift the blade just a little bit so you don't hit that one again and, uh, and don't do any damage because that could do some damage. <laughs> you clear on the road, sometimes the snow kind of slows down and it's not as heavy and you don't really have to keep running your route. So we had a friend that owned a uh, pig farm. And we used to just go hang out at the pig farm at night and take a nap. He's like, yeah, come on up, park your truck. It was right with on, in our route. We just park up there and this is the pig farm. They raised pigs for when people had like pig roast. So if you wanted to have a pig roast, this is the guy you'd go to in the area for a pig. So we would go up there, we'd rest, have some, maybe a beverage or two. Because <laughs> sometimes you'd be there for a couple hours, you know, you just the snow would die down, but you still had to be on call. Once they call you, they don't send you home because you have to guarantee you four hours. So if they call you in, you're working four hours and the snow slows down, but there's a second wave coming, then they would have to pay you another four hours if they called you home, sent you home. So we just kind of hung out and did our own thing. But the most interesting part was, and I thought this was an urban legend, but everyone told me about this guy who would stand in his picture window. He had this giant picture window in front of his house up on a hill on a cul-de-sac. And he would stand in his window in his underwear and with his arms by his hips, kind of like he was like Superman. He would just stare at you. Well, I, I never saw him. The whole winter I was plowing the first winter. I'd never saw the guy. So I thought it was just, wow, he did just yank at my cord because I'm the new guy. But sure enough, one of the later storms, it, it, we had a lot of storms that winter, so there was a lot of snow we had to move. Sure enough, I come up the hill, come up to the cul-de-sac, make my loop around, and there he is standing in the window. I was like, whoa, <laughs> was, all right. I was like, wow, they weren't lying to me. They, this guy really is for real. And so I was like, all right, well, I just went on and did my thing. He has kind of a unique driveway in the cul-de-sac. It's a U-shaped driveway with a fire hydrant right in the middle. So it's, it takes up pretty much a third of the cul-de-sac. And then there's two other houses on there. So there's not a lot of room to move snow when you have to clear the whole cul-de-sac. So I, I, I cleared it and I leave and do more, all my other ones. And I come back up the next time up and I'm driving, I'm going my outer loop around, just clear the snow. And all of a sudden he comes out, flying out of his house, out of the driveway, jumps right in front of my truck and just stands there with his arms by his side in his underwear. And I'm like, Whoa, buddy. And he's screaming and yelling at me. You can't put snow on my driveway. Typical complaint to people that, you know, they don't like the snowplow guy because they dump snow. And I do my best not to and try to put it off into other areas where you can. But that cul-de-sac is so difficult because of how many houses are. And we had so much snow that year that I really had no place to push it, but to spread it all the way around the whole thing. And he didn't like that. So he started yelling at me. We had some words. And I said, all right, I don't want to get into a fight with this guy in the three o'clock in the morning. And so I just called our town guy that we have as our supervisor for the town. And I says, hey, this is what's going on. He's like, oh yeah, we know that guy. Meet me at our check-in point and we'll, we'll go over it. So I, so I leave back up, lift the blade and just drive off. And I meet up with him and he says, yeah, you know what? Don't plow his street anymore. When you get to the hill, just turn around and go back. 
Don't bother cleaning the hill. Don't do the top of the hill. Just avoid it for the rest of the season. Just don't even do it. We'll take care of it after the storm is over and we'll clear it when we get a chance with one of our trucks that, that can get up that hill. And uh, it was just a pretty steep hill. It's the steepest hill on our route. And I had the only truck that could make it up this hill. So I'm sure his neighbors were not happy that his road no longer got plowed. And for, their, for the rest of the couple years that I plowed, I never went up that hill ever again. So it, it's usually, it, and it depends pretty much on the town and where you are. If they're gonna get like two inches or more, or if, usually they, they don't call us unless they know they're gonna get four inches. At less than four inches, at a couple inches, they can salt and sand. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll put a brine down beforehand, before the snow comes, and then that'll start to melt the snow as it lands. So the first couple inches won't really stick, especially early in the season and late in the season. Midwinter in like January, when it's 10 degrees outside, that's a different issue. But early and late in the season, it's usually they don't call us unless they know they're gonna get four inches, because they're gonna have us out for four hours, no matter what and they, they pay good money. So it's interesting, and a lot of times you just sit around and wait until you get the phone call, because you know you're gonna get it. But they wait until the snow starts to stick on the road before they make the call. It, it's not bad, it's fine. I mean, it's four wheel drive. A lot of the times I didn't even have it in four wheel drive. I just drive around in two wheels. The only time I would throw it in four wheels when I had to go up the hills. So, I mean, and, and I grew up driving in New England in the snow with rear wheel drive cars without any nanny controls, no traction controls you get used to it. And so when you're driving a truck, it's even easier. You know, it's a lot of fun because you just kind of feel like you own the road. The big thing is that, you know, if it's during the daytime, the cars that are on the road get annoying. They want to get around you. They want to pass you. They want to do anything to not be slowed down. And so they kind of get in the way a lot and it's hard to plow sometimes in the traffic and it, so daytime sucks. Daytime is like the worst time because it's just, you can't, they want, everyone wants the road clear and clean, but you can't clear and clean and clear the road when there's cars all over it and driving on it. So it's, makes it challenging. That's why nighttime is just, it, it's so much better at nighttime. Successful car purchasing is all about knowing your buying power and being able to move quickly. And the best way to do that is getting pre-qualified with Premier Financial Services. Call one of these numbers, speak to one of their representatives, fill out their application, and then you'll know exactly how much car you can buy. You'll approach a seller, tell them you're already qualified, you've got your simple lease set up from Premier Financial, and you'll be able to close very, very quickly. That's why Premier is one of the most powerful partners in the world of exotic car financing, and that's why I turn to them every time I go out and try to buy something crazy.